Okay, this is designed to uh, give you a bit of a heads up about what we're going to be learning about ne next lesson, the uh, final section of the course, 1945 to 51, Labour in Power. We start off with the 1945 election. This, as you can see, was held after victory over Germany in 1945, but before victory had been secured over Japan. Now, Labour very unexpectedly won a landslide, as you can see, they won. Uh, 393 seats against uh, Tories 197. They won 62% of the total. Uh, how did Churchill, who was the war hero who won the war for Britain, how did he actually lose this election in 1945? Well, there are two major reasons for this. One was la Labour's successes, and two, and the second one was Conservative failures. First of all, the Labour had a very optimistic message under their leader Clement Attlee. They promised to build a new Jerusalem uh, with a welfare state for the people. They also released a manifesto saying, let us face the future, being very, very positive about their message. Britain at this time needed change. After fighting World War II against Hitler, there was no stomach for a return to the 1930s era depression that had come before. The UK public wanted change. They wanted the welfare state, which had been set out in the Beveridge Report of 1942. Also, the Conservatives were still remembered as the party that had appeased Hitler in the 1930s. So... The optimistic message, the need for a change, was also accompanied by a leftward shift during the war. The Soviet Union had been on the UK's side during the war, we'd fought together against the Nazis, therefore socialism was seen as being more popular. During the war, as we learned last lesson, state had taken over most of the economy. The Ministry for Labour, the Ministry for Armaments, I mean the state planning had been in existence and that had helped win the war. Therefore state planning and uh, socialism was much more popular after the war than before it. Also, the key leaders of Labour, Attlee, Bevan and Bevin, had they'd all served in the War Cabinet, Labour seen as being patriotic and reliable. These Labour successes were coupled with some Conservative failures. First of all, the Conservative Party focused heavily on Churchill. They spent less money on their campaign, relying on the name of Churchill to win. Churchill also made lots of visits around the country to rally support, to give speeches, but he never actually talked about his ideas, he talked about how he had won the war. Thirdly, Churchill was admired for his war work, but many still remembered him as the old Tory of the 1930s, who would do nothing to help them in peacetime. They saw him as a good war leader, but not someone for peace. He also made a huge mistake called the Gestapo speech. You've been learning about the Gestapo in the uh, Nazi side of the course. He, Churchill stood up and said that if Labour was to be elected and to govern, they would set up their own version of the Gestapo. Now, to those people who had fought in the war, 4.5 million British people fought in the war, this was hugely offensive that he had used the Gestapo and used the Nazis for political gain. This showed Hitler Churchill to be out of touch. Therefore, Labour won in 1945, and they had three priorities. First of all, they had to deal with this huge economic crisis. We've borrowed £2.7 billion pounds off USA, we need to pay that back. Secondly, they had to deal with the nationalisation of key industries. Nationalisation means uh, buying uh, by the state, so the state can run them. The third thing they have to do is try and set up a welfare state, set up a system of benefits and health for all the people in the country. Let's have a look at how they do in each of these three things. First of all, dealing with the economic crisis. They had some successes. First of all, loans from the USA. They borrowed $3.7 billion from the USA in 1945. They were also given $1.5 billion by Canada. This meant the UK could actually buy vital imports and keep itself going during this time. Marshall Aid, a US program to give money to European countries, was also received in 1947-48. The successful negotiation of these loans is seen as being a big success of Labour for uh, uh, dealing with the economic crisis. They also helped with exports. They increased their exports by 80%. Exports means selling to other countries. This went up 80% between 46 and 50. This was 50% higher in 1950 than before the war in 37. Twice as many cars were exported uh, after the war than before. And by 1950, a trade surplus had been created, meaning that we are now a big trading nation again. We're exporting again. Um, as for failures, borrowing all that money from the USA and Canada meant that we had lost economic control. We were forced to make the pound and the dollar convertible. Now, I'm not going to go into the deep economics of it, but it meant that we handed over power of the economy over to the US. We also had to open up our empire to US competition, so firms from the US could go in there and sell their products. And by 1947, dollars had run out and a new crisis began, so these loans were just a short-term fix. There was a massive crisis in 1941 with the exports crisis. The US reduced demand for British goods, meaning there was a huge trade deficit with the USA. One pound, uh, the value of a pound collapsed from $4.03 to $2.80. And when we tried to rearm, when the Korean War happened in 1950 and 1953, there was a huge rearmament program which again caused a massive balance of payments. All of this shows that the economic recovery it's very, very, very fragile during this time. Next, the uh, next issue was trying to nationalise by the key industries of the country. 
there were some great successes. The scale of nationalisation was incredible. 20% of the economy was nationalised, which meant 10% of people were employed by the state. That would be about 5 million people. Most of the fuel, power, production, transport, steel industry and bank of England were all nationalised by the state. This led to big growth. For instance, British Airways, or BOAC, it was called in, those, in that time, massively increased. And also, most of the country electrified and cable and radio communications were improved. So there's big growth thanks to nationalisation. But this, there were some, also some big failures in this sector. First of all, the cost. £2.7 billion was spent on buying the industries at a time when they were undergoing an economic crisis. Most of the industries were unprofitable, costing the taxpayer money. And coal mines and railways required taxpayer subsidy, meaning the taxpayer always had to pay to keep them running. Also, for the workers involved, the conditions did not improve. Coal miners had the same bosses and managers as before. Paying conditions did not improve, and workers had no say on how their industries were run. So the nationalisation of uh, key industries was a big, mixed bag for the Labour government. Finally, the welfare state. The Labour came in with the promise that from the cradle to the grave, they would look after you, they'd protect you. The big successes were in health. First of all, the National Health Act was passed in 1946. It set up the National Health Service, the NHS, which is still with us today. 88% of doctors and 95% of dentists joined the NHS. 8.5 million dental patients treated and 5.25 million spectacles were issued in the first year alone. This led Roundtree to commission another study, which found a vast improvement in health from in 1945 from, from 1899, which shows how the, the, the course of um, this unit, health has increased massively. Also, there were other aspects of the welfare state. 1.5 million new homes were built, with 250,000 temporary prefab homes also built. National insurance now applied to all employees in 1946 for unemployment, pensions, sickness pay. The benefit system that we have now was set up in 1946. Also, there was the National Assistance Act of 1948 providing benefits and homeless shelters to those who were in poverty. These were huge successes of the welfare state. However, the welfare state also had its limitations. There was 10,000 dentists to cater for 47 million people in 48. There was no unified system. There were 163 different health boards and 19 hospital boards, meaning your quality of health care you received depended on where you lived in the country. Costs were much higher than expected. Uh, and again, at the time of economic crisis, we had to borrow this money from the USA. Education. The grammar school system divided children up at 11, deciding whether you went to a, a secondary school, a grammar school, or a technical school. Some felt like failures if they didn't pass the test. And also those technical schools were neglected and secondary schools didn't become very well respected, meaning that the education system they didn't really get right during that time. All of these things show then that the key things to know for the exam are the successes and failures of each of these three aspects here, and then the Labour successes and the Conservative failures for explaining why in 45 Labour won in the first place. Thank you very much.